Wearing several hats this morning and uh, kind of uh, trying to get things straight in my mind. We'd like to welcome you to the services of the Center Street Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. Our ushers are coming to the front with uh, uh, our attendance cards. And part of that card's for our visitors. If you are visiting with us, we hope that you'll fill that out so that we might uh, have a record of your visit. And also, we hope you'll stay around after services this morning so that we might get the opportunity to know you better. This morning, uh, our song service is going to be led by Trent Hanna, and uh, I'll be bringing the lesson uh, in just a few minutes. Trent? Good morning. If it's convenient, let's all stand, stand for our first song. <laughs>
Pray with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the health we're able to enjoy this morning so that we can come together to worship you and sing songs of praise. And we're thankful for Trent and his ability to lead us in song and just pray that we'll pay close attention to the words that we sing and not just go through the motions, uh, but just have a, a true uh, worship this morning in truth and in spirit. And uh, we pray, Lord, that. Uh, you'll be with this family that meets here, uh, that you'll help us to always be an encouragement to one another, to edify each other in the way that you'd have us to, uh, that we'll be attentive to those that are struggling right now, that are struggling physically and spiritually, and we'll do a better job of encouraging them and, and getting them to service and, and just help them to be a part of this family uh, so that they can uh, improve their life, uh, not just for the here and now, but for eternity. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that are dealing with uh, the loss of loved ones right now. Uh, we're mindful of Judy Looper and, and Kylie Vaughn and, and Dave Tabeast, and, and we just know that that's a, a struggle to go through, and, and uh, we pray that your blessings will be on each of those families. Uh, we also ask, Lord, that you'd be with Emma. Uh, we know she and her family are concerned about her knee, and just pray that uh, you'll give them a safe trip uh, to children's today and, and that her surgery tomorrow will be successful and that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that tend to her and just help her to be encouraged and know that uh, she'll be thought of frequently uh, this week as she's trying to recover and uh, just help her to, to uh, put trust and, and faith in you. We also are thankful, Lord, for uh, the successful surgery for Barbara Johnson and, and Jake Greer and and we know that things are on track for them, and we give you the praise and the glory for that. Uh, Lord, so oftentimes we get caught up in our, our physical ailments and the things that uh, are in the here and now, and we just ask that you'd help us to be more attentive to our spiritual uh, well-being, that we'll uh, do a better job of serving others, that we'll do a better job of uh, staying close to your word and uh, having a better understanding of your desire for us uh, each day. And, Help us to be the influence we should on those around us, to have the courage and the backbone we need to, to speak to others about you and about Christ and, and the plan that's been put in place for each of us. And, and we know, Lord, that we don't uh, have the ability to, to earn our way to heaven, but we also know that there are acts of obedience that must be carried out uh, in order, order for us to, to receive your grace and mercy that we so desperately need. We pray that you'll be with us throughout this service this morning and that the things we do will be pleasing to you. And for all these things that we've asked, we just pray that you'll forgive us when we fall short in those areas. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. 
next song in preparation for the Lord's Supper.
If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, we'll be reading the scripture from 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. 1 John chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Translation. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that you've given us and for this time that we have to worship you. And, and as we as a church partake of this bread, Father, we just pray that, that you're with us, that our minds are in the right place, and that we remember that sacrifice that was made on behalf of all of us on the cross and help us reflect on that. And, and we're so thankful for that sacrifice, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bow. 
Our Father in heaven, as we uh, continue, uh, continue this remembrance, Father, we just thank you so much for the love that was shown and the mercy you've provided, Father. We thank you so much for that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And as we take this uh, fruit juice of the vine, we uh, just uh, pray that we take it with an open and, uh, uh, mind and, and um, truly reflect on, on the great sacrifice that was made for us so that we may uh, enjoy eternity in heaven with you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This concludes the, the Lord's Supper. As a matter of convenience, we'll now uh, have our uh, contribution. And I'd like to read a passage from uh, Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 41. Mark 12, verse 41. And he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to a cent and calling his disciples to him he said to them truly I say to you this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury for they all put in out of their surplus but she out of her poverty put in all she owned all she had to live on let's bow 
Father, we're so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and the death that he suffered on that cross. We're thankful for his willingness, and we're thankful, Father, that the sacrifice that he made gives us the hope of eternal life. Father, we're thankful that we live in this, in the Christian age where we have the, the grace of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful, Father, for this new covenant that we live under. Father, we're thankful for all the spiritual blessings that we have, for our spiritual family, and for the peace that you give us, for the avenue of prayer that we can approach your throne anytime. And Father, we want to thank you for the physical blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the health that we enjoy. We thank you, Father, for our families. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you, Father, for food, for clothing, for shelter, for all the many things that you've given us, Father. We know we're the most blessed people in the entire world. And we thank you, Father, for the continued blessings that we have. And we pray, Father, as we uh, give this morning that we will do so with a cheerful heart. We pray that, that you will bless us as givers, and we pray that, that we will be rewarded spiritually for our, for our giving, not monetarily, but that you will reward us in a way that only you can. And Father, we pray that you'll be with, be with us as a congregation, that we will use these funds to, to further the gospel, to share the good news of what you've done for us with the entire world. We pray all these things through your son Jesus' name. Amen. Sing to me a
be seen. It's great to see such a good crowd here this morning. We're so glad that, uh, again, that all of you are here. Jack has asked me to uh, uh, make an introduction of some uh, college students who have placed membership uh, here at Center Street. And uh, they are Braden and Nicola Moore. Uh, and uh, I tried to find them before services, but was not able. There you are, okay. Stand up, please. There's Brian and Nicola, and they are brother and sister. In the nick of time, you can sit back down now. And uh, I'll ask them to come out in the foyer so that they might uh, uh, meet as many people as possible uh, this morning. There's a very revealing story in the Old Testament book of Esther. The setting for the story uh, is in the far-flung Persian Empire during the time of Xerxes, or he's also called Ahasuerus uh, in the Bible. This powerful and famous king ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India over there on the east all the way to Ethiopia down there in the southwest. In his day, Ahasuerus was the most powerful man on earth. For his prime minister, Ahasuerus chose a man by the name of Haman. Although a detailed description is not given in the scriptures, he must have been a man of outstanding natural ability and must have proved his uh, worthiness uh, through years of faithful service. At this point in his life, Haman had everything in his power or in his favor. He had power, and he had wealth, and he had prestige, and he had the confidence of the most powerful man in the world. But I should like to tell the story in the words of the scriptures themselves. Beginning in the opening verses of the third chapter of Esther, we read, After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Although no reason for Mordecai's unwillingness to bow in reverence to Haman is given at this point in the story. We know that as a faithful Jew, his loyalty to Jehovah was the reason that he could not bow down. The text continues, when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasuries. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of 
Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, The silver is yours, and the people also, to do with them as you please. With this permission having been received, Haman set about to marshal the people of the entire empire in an unholy scheme to destroy the Jews and especially Mordecai. The text continues. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children. In one day, the 13th of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. At this point in the story, Queen Esther invited King Ahasuerus, and Haman came to her chambers for an elaborate banquet. Haman was overjoyed that he had been elevated to the high position of being the intimate companion of both the king and the queen. Leaving the banquet, he was exceedingly proud, as we read in the text. Then Haman went out that day glad and pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Apparently, even in the best of moods, even in a moment of elation, just the sight of Mordecai, his enemy, made Haman angry and full of rage. Upon arriving home, Haman told his wife of his special honors and then said, Yet all of this does not satisfy me. Every time I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate, then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows fifty cubits high made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased Haman. So he had the gallows made. A second banquet was given by Queen Esther. A banquet to which she again invited the king and Haman. After the meal, the king offered the queen whatever she might request, even to the half of the kingdom, chapter 7 and verse 2. At this point, Esther identified herself as Jewish, and she made a plea for the lives of her people. Ahasuerus was angry when he realized how he had been used by Haman, how he had been unknowingly manipulated to do Haman's bidding. At this point, we read, Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king, and the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai. And the king's anger subsided. Why have I wanted to tell a 2,500-year-old story this morning? The reason is we live in a world of hate. 
And God continues to try to do something about it. But he needs your cooperation and he needs mine. He had talent, rich experience, wealth, prestige, power, and the confidence of the king who provided him a position of great prominence. But Haman allowed a festering sore of hate to ruin his prospects and to snuff out his life. Few things are so devastating to a person as a strong feeling of hatred toward someone else. Few things are so destructive to one's own peace of mind and happiness as this ugly emotion of resentment. The world in which we live is indeed a world of hate. With all its natural beauty and unlimited resources, it could be a heaven on earth. It was. The Garden of Eden was paradise. But then came sin. Jealousy, strife, tension, rivalry, resentment, and hate appear to be everywhere. Hatred exists between nations, but it's also the blight of families. What a paradise this world could be if people loved each other. First of all, this morning, and I know that was a really long introduction, but the points won't be as long. Let's see what the New Testament has to say on hate. One who is familiar with the Bible finds an ever-recurring theme in the numerous warnings against hate and the numerous encouragements to love one's fellow man. In the great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I'd like to stop there for just a moment. Why does Jesus call on us to love our enemies? Because it works? Because it's practical? Well, it can be. But it might not be. A bunch of people at Shabbat last Saturday, a week ago yesterday, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, were gathered together, worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's really no indication that they had malice toward people. But there is indication that a man who came along with hate took their lives. Why does God call upon us to love our enemies? 
It doesn't always work. Just ask the survivors in Pittsburgh. I believe that God calls upon us to love our enemies because that's what he does. And he says, be ye holy as I am holy. We have opponents. We have those with whom we have disagreement. We have maybe people who hate us. God did. And John 3.16 tells us what he did about it. God loves his enemies. He expects us to love ours. That's why. Jesus went on to say in the next chapter, forgive our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And there's an intimation there that, that there is a quid pro quo in that. That we perform the forgiveness of others and God forgives us. Sort of sounds like that, doesn't it? Well, in Matthew 6.15, it sounds more like that. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Luke 17, 3 and 4. Jesus is quoted as saying, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, Forgive him. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, described himself and other Christians as when we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. That's a how-to manual on Bad relationships, isn't it? Colossians 3, 12 and 13, Paul wrote, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you so also should you. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 8, and 9, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit A blessing. But God's disapproval of hate did not develop sometime in the 500 year period between the Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament has a lot to say on the subject and finds a lot of ways to disapprove of it. Exodus 23, 4 and 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or donkey wandering away, You shall surely return it to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. Solomon also spoke on this general subject. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad. When he stumbles, 
That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. If you know someone who has fancy footwork and who knows they have fancy footwork and are quite proud of their fancy footwork to the point where they lord their fancy footwork over yours to see them trip brings a grin, doesn't it? Of course it does. Solomon says, that's not God's approved attitude. Also, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for you will keep burning, heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. This passage also appears in the New Testament where it's quoted in Romans chapter 12, verses 20 and 21 by the Apostle Paul. Of course, there are many other passages that also emphasize the need to be concerned about others and to treat them with love rather than with hate, with concern, not with indifference. God is the same from the beginning, now, and forever. He has not changed in his attitude toward hate. It has been unwavering. And we have that responsibility to develop it. In connection with our theme, there are some stories that I feel are worth hearing. 20th century preacher Clarence McCartney wrote this story. During one of the persecutions of the Armenians by the Turks, an Armenian girl and her brother were pursued by a bloodthirsty Turkish soldier. He trapped them at the end of the lane and killed the brother right in front of the sister. The girl managed to escape by leaping over a wall and fleeing out into the country. Later, she became a nurse, and one day, a wounded soldier was brought into her hospital. She recognized him immediately. He was the soldier who had killed her brother and who would have killed her had she not escaped. His condition was such that the least neglect or carelessness on the part of the nurse would have cost him his life. But she gave him the most painstaking and constant care. One day, when he was on the road to recovery, he recognized her as the girl whose brother he had killed. Why have you done this for me who killed your brother, he asked. She answered, because I have a religion which teaches me to forgive my enemies. Edmund Fuller tells the story of how one night a black man was walking along 42nd Street in New York City, back around the turn of the 20th century. He was going from the terminal uh, at the train station to the hotel where he was to stay. He was carrying a heavy suitcase and an even heavier valise. Suddenly, a hand took hold of the valise and a pleasant voice said, Pretty heavy, brother. Suppose you let me take one. I'm going your way. The black man resisted, but finally allowed the young white man to assist him in carrying his burden. And for several blocks, they walked along. And that, said Booker T. Washington, years afterward, was the first time I ever saw Theodore Roosevelt. 
The greatest of all stories, however, is that which is foretold in Isaiah 53. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. From the human standpoint, Jesus had reason to express hatred toward the enemies who nailed him to a cross, who beat him before he got there, who made him carry the thing, who raised him up to die. From the human standpoint, he could have shriveled them up like the dry leaves which are starting to fall from our trees. Yet on the cross instead he prayed, Father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. This is the greatest example of love triumphing over hate that the world has ever known. How does that happen? Just how is it possible for people to replace the enmities and hatreds which seem so natural with the love that is so much more desirable? Well, there's some things we can remember. Number one, the possibility of this kind of change begins with the realization that God is love. It's stated by the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. God is not a person that we come together and sing our hearts out to on Sunday morning and remember his gift for us on the cross on Sunday morning. And perhaps we're really dedicated. We come back and hear another lesson on Sunday night and we come to Bible class on Wednesday night and we came to Bible class this morning. And then we lock all the doors so he can't get out. God's influence impacts us every single day. Every single moment. And when we start to compartmentalize things, we're starting to get in trouble. My favorite type of plate is a school cafeteria plate. Now don't get me wrong, it's not the school cafeteria food. Sorry, Donna. It's not the school cafeteria food that I like best. It's the school cafeteria plate. Why is that? Because it has sections and there are dividers and juice from my beans is not going to get over here and ruin my mashed potatoes or my roll or my meat. I just like that to be in its own place. Well, it all gets mixed up after you, well, who wants to think about that, number one? that's You're not helping. And number... And number two, people laugh at me because I don't like my food to touch. I just don't. I just don't, okay? It's a, you don't have to not like your food to touch, but I like mine not to touch. It's just, that's me. That's all fine and good when it comes to your plate. But you cannot do that with your life. You can't have a God compartment and a work compartment and a school compartment and a friend compartment and a party compartment and a football compartment. God's in all that. And if he can't be in it, you ought not to be in it. 
If you can't let him in there, you ought to not be in there. And if God can't get in our politics, we'd best shut it off. Our political opinion should be influenced by and only by what God thinks about them. Then we need to remember that man was created in the image of God as mentioned in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. We have something of God in us. We are created in his image. And if I am created in his image, that means you are created in his image. And therefore, any respect due me is due you. Any love due me is due you. Any rights conferred upon me are conferred upon you. Doesn't matter who's in charge of the state or the county or the federal government. Doesn't, that doesn't make any difference. We're created in God's image and those things which are in all of us, are in all of us, and to be respected as such, and therefore each one of us is to be respected as such. Number three, the statement of John, we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. It's from Jesus that we learn what it means to love even our enemies, but it goes back even further than that. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. It goes back to that paradise that God made, and he said, eat anything you want except this. The, tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil can't have any. And they messed it up for everybody. Did you ever get told that you'd messed it up for everybody? Happens sometimes, doesn't it? Adam and Eve messed it up for everybody. Jesus came to make it right for everybody. To straighten things out for everybody. To make us bearers of that image of God which is placed within us. And he did it by sacrificing himself on the cross. God sent him by sacrificing his son on the cross. You and I, this morning, need to understand that the reason we love other people is because God first loved us. If any man loves the world, we need to remember 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, the love of the Father is not in him. It is the love of the world that causes the trouble. Man loves things so much that he often hates people. Sometimes we hate other people who have things that we want. Sometimes we hate other people who want to take things that we have. Such love for the world and its material contents is off limits for Christians. In this same book of 1 John, there is this indictment. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one whom does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Why? 
because he's got some God in him too. He's made in the image of God. She's made in the image of God. So if we can remember that God is love, that we are created in God's image, that the love of the world causes the hatred of man, then with Christ's example to guide us, we have the formula by which we can change a world of hate into a world of love. And my brothers and sisters, it starts with you and it starts with me. And when we have our political discussions, the demand to love starts with you and it starts with me. And when we have interpersonal relationships with family, at work, at school, it starts with you and it starts with me. Because only you can make the choice for you. Won't you make the right one? God loved you so much, he sent his son to save you. He extends his invitation to you. If you need to, won't you come? While we stand and sing. morning if you're visiting with us we welcome you here please come back we'll meet again tonight at six we'll meet again on wednesday night at uh, seven o'clock as, as uh, chad prayed please keep uh, barbara johnson and uh, jake greer in your prayers they were recovering from their surgery also we've been told that betty deering was taken to the emergency room at washington regional this morning so i uh, pray that uh, uh, that'll be taken care of quickly Keep uh, Emma uh, hollering in your prayers as well as Todd and Angel as they head down to Little Rock to Children's uh, for Emma's surgery this week. Pray that that will be a uh, total success. Also, those that have lost loved ones, uh, Judy Looper, uh, Kylie Vaughn, uh, the Tobias family, keep all those in our prayers as they are remembering their lost loved ones. 
If you need a parking decal uh, for a parking lot, they're free. Check with Chad. He's got those. Uh, you're welcome to grab one. Also, don't forget that today at uh, Jason's Deli this evening between 4 and uh, 9 p.m. is a, a fundraiser for our Lads Leaders Leader Ed program. If you go there and order food, make sure you let them know that uh, uh, you're with the Center Street Congregation, so that'll be taken care of. Also, for the Lads Leaders in another week, Bible Bowl, you're going to have a quiz. Check the bulletin for that. I believe it's at 5 o'clock next Sunday. For the 310 devotional, that's going to be this week. It's going to be at uh, the home of Alan and Patsy Cohorn. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Ladies' devotional is going to be on Tuesday. That's going to be at the home of Lou Ellen Glossop uh, Tuesday evening. Also, keep uh, the youth in our prayers this week as they're preparing for the uh, Deeper Youth Conference. That's going to be Friday and Saturday. Uh, pray for success on that. Tonight, our uh, Sunday night Bible class for our youth for grades 3 through 12 will uh, we'll continue. Um, and so um, uh, they'll come up for our devotional when we're done. Elders would like to remind the congregation that uh, last year we donated $10,000 for the improvements of uh, Green Valley Bible Camp. Uh, there were a lot of contributions that were uh, made individually for that. The elders are committed to do this for the next two years. And so we're planning on devoting 10000 each year uh, for that. Uh, if you were here to hear Brian Davenport's uh, presentation, improvements are being made. It's a great facility. Uh, we encourage you to pray about that and do what we can individually uh, to help support those improvements also. Finally, this Wednesday night, Instead of our regular devotional, we're going to be spending some time in prayer on behalf of Billy Davenport. Billy's getting ready to head to the Marines, uh, so we encourage you to be here, uh, be a part of that as an encouragement for, for him. Any other announcements I'm forgetting? If you'll grab a songbook, we'll have a closing song and closing prayer. Let's all stand and pray that. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing it in the first day, sing it in the grace. In the love of the nations, pride and blessed, in the universal place. When we all get together, what a wondrous is ever been. Our gracious and holy Father, we give you thanks, Father, for this time we've had to get together and assemble as your children, to hear a portion from your word, to sing praises, and to worship you, Father. We pray that all we've said and done this morning has been in accordance with your will and brought glory to your name. Be with those of our number who are sick, Father. Uh, give them healing. For those who are grieving, give them comfort and strength, Father, to endure uh, uh, these difficult times. Father, as we depart here this morning, help us to uh, have the strength to do your will. Give us the courage to pro proclaim Jesus in our daily walk with you. And 
Help us, Father, to uh, not be haters, to, to be filled with, with love, Father, and your perfect love and the love of Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.